All right, welcome everyone. Today we're going to be talking about chapter six. We're going to be starting our new unit on the skeletal system. And today we're really going to just be focusing on skeletal tissue, um, a little bit about cartilage first and then into the skeletal tissue. So we'll review a little bit about cartilage. We talked about it in our tissues lecture, but now we're going to talk about it in relation to bone. And then we're going to talk really mostly about uh, bones and uh, skeletal tissue. So we're going to talk about it macroscopically, which means, you know, just grossly, and then also microscopically. So what do you see under the microscope? And then we're going to talk a little bit about how bones develop or bone modeling, they call it, and then also remodeling. There's constant turnover of bone tissue all the time. So you're constantly breaking down uh, your bones and remodeling them and, and laying down new bone tissue. Um, and that's part of the reason why it's so good at healing. So how do bones heal? And then a little bit about uh, disorders of bone and skeletal tissue. So just a little review about where our cartilage lives in the body. And re remember back to our tissues lecture, we talked about three different types of cartilage. So hyaline cartilage is definitely the most common and where and we have the most of it in the body. So that's going to be in blue. So anything you see in blue. So most of the um, uh, hyaline cartilage is found at the end of our long bones and having to be in the joints um, as well as in the rib cage, those costal cartilages uh, and your nose. So that's where we find all that hyaline cartilage. We'll talk a little bit more about the respiratory system and uh, the cartilage in our trachea, those uh, tracheal rings. So um, it's very important function in the respiratory system as well, um, as well as the larynx. So we see a lot of cartilage in the larynx. So that's hyaline cartilage all over the body. Think joints, um, and we'll talk a lot more about joints at the end of this unit. And then we do have elastic cartilage in green, and so not very much of that is found in the body. Really, you just think your ear, so very um, flexible, right, moldable. So that's your elastic cartilage, as well as the epiglottis in the larynx. So again, it's part of this structure in your throat. Um, part of your swallowing mechanism is the epiglottis. And we'll talk a lot more about that in uh, the respiratory system and the digestive system. And then last but not least, we have fibrocartilage. So that's kind of, um, it's very much like hyaline cartilage, uh, but it's a little bit different, has a little bit more give, a little more um, elasticity, even though it's not uh, like elastic cartilage. So we find that in a couple of places. So mostly think your intervertebral discs, okay? So they're found in between your vertebrae and that's what um, gives a lot of compression ability within your vertebrae, within your spine, as well as the pubic symphysis. So your two pubic bones, your pelvic bones, come together at the pubic symphysis, okay? And then we also find fibrocartilage in the knee as well. So some of you may have heard of athletes tearing their meniscus. And the meniscus is this little disc that sits in your knee. And we'll again, we'll talk a lot more about uh, the knee and joints when we get to our joint lecture at the end of the unit. So what are some important things about cartilage? And this should be a little bit of review from our tissue lecture. Uh, the cell type of cartilage are chondrocytes. So remember we talked about chondroblasts that are going to be creating the extracellular matrix and then when they get stuck they're going to become a mature chondrocyte cell living within those little lacunae, which are just these little circles around the cell. Okay, because we talked about how um, structure, how much structure the extracellular matrix has, right? Not as strong as bone, um, but it has a very jelly like um, matrix, right? So it's kind of firm. So that's why these chondrocytes get stuck in those little lacunae, just like bone tissue. And we'll talk more about bone. <laughs> 
So what's new about cartilage? That should have been a little bit of review. Um, there is a membrane that surrounds all of our cartilage and that's the perichondrium. So we're gonna have a membrane that surrounds the bone tissue as well. So we'll talk about that. So that, that's something they have in common. Uh, but essentially what this perichondrium does is it um, allows for, so because we talked about how much compression strength that the uh, cartilage has, right? It can take concussive force, which is why it's in your joints, but you have to have something to kind of contain that outward pressure, and that's gonna be the perichondrium. Okay, so it's gonna keep the uh, cartilage in place so it doesn't just squirt out the sides of your joints, right? It keeps it contained because you have a lot of pressure um, on that cartilage that's coming uh, from your joints, okay? A lot of concussive force. But another big thing about the perichondrium, and same with the periosteum when we get to the bone part, is that they're gonna be very important for the growth and repair of cartilage. So they're gonna have those uh, chondroblasts in there that are gonna help um, produce and create the cartilage tissue. And just a little review too, it's mostly that, that extracellular matrix is mostly water, right? So it can hold a lot of water, which really gives it a lot of resilience. So it can really spring back to shape. It's gonna take a lot of concussive force, but it can, um, it can come right back to its original form. So how does cartilage grow? There's really two main ways that cartilage can grow. And one is through that perichondrium. So we call that appositional growth. And essentially those chondroblasts, those, those um, immature cells that are gonna be producing the matrix um, live in that perichondrium. So they can create new cartilage from that um, outer membrane. And then interstitial growth, so think appositional is kind of outside, right? The perichondrium is around the outside of the cartilage, whereas the interstitial growth is um, inside the cartilage. So those chondrocytes that are now mature cells are activated uh, to be able to create a new matrix. And interstitial growth is a lot less um, common because we know that cartilage is fairly poor at, um, uh, at repairing itself. So that would be interstitial growth. Now your cartilage is gonna be very active during uh, development, right? So that cartilage is a big reason why we are, we're growing, right? So cartilage stops growing when we stop growing. So then it just becomes um, part of your uh, joints. Whereas when we look at how bones grow, they actually develop um, as cartilage first. Your bones start as cartilage and then we replace that cartilage tissue with bone tissue. So it's quite interesting that we start out as cartilage. So now let's get into bones. So we talked a lot about cartilage, which is really important um, for how we actually develop our bony tissue. So we'll talk about that. And bone itself is an organ. So, you know, we know that bone tissue is a connective tissue, but uh, a bone, a whole, whole bone is an organ because there are multiple tissue types uh, that we can see um, in the bone. So not only do you have that connective tissue of bone, but you also have blood. So you have blood vessels in there. You have cartilage on those joint surfaces. So that's part and that's a different connective tissue. Um, so you have a lot of other tissues in the bone, which is why it's an organ. You have nerves, right, coming in and innervating um, the periosteum, so that outer layer that we'll talk about. And then also within those blood vessels, you all the blood vessels are lined with epithelial tissue, right, that endothelium, which is that simple squamous epithelial tissue. <laughs> 
And so our whole point of having bones, what's the whole function of bones, right? We know that they're supportive, they're protective, but they allow for movement and the muscles are what are gonna move our bones. And then a big thing too, is it's a place to store minerals, especially calcium. So that's kind of why we have a constant turnover of bone because we need a constant source of calcium in our body. But we also create all of our blood cells there. So all of our red blood cells, white blood cells are all created um, in the uh, inside the bone, in the bone marrow. Okay, so and we'll talk a lot more about bone marrow and where it lives. But again, uh, it also stores some fat too. We have two different types of bone marrow and one um, is a very fat filled um, bone marrow. So we actually can store some fat and which can help with energy metabolism. So now let's look at the bone tissue itself. And this should be a little bit of a review from our tissue lecture, but we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper. So we have two components and the first one is organic. So these are gonna be our cells, right? Our osteoblasts, osteoclasts, we'll talk more about those cells, as well as the fiber, right? So what type of fiber was um, the most common in bone tissue? It's the same as in cartilage and in tendons, that's right, collagen fiber, as well as that ground substance. So remember our fibers and our ground substance make up that extracellular matrix. And the organic comp components are what give bone its flexibility and tensile strength. So bone is actually quite flexible, even though you don't think of bone as being flexible, it really is, it can take a lot of um, force, right? And then it has inorganic components. So we have organic and inorganic. And these guys are what are gonna give it the hardness and the resistance to compression. So all of those mineral salts, uh, calcium phosphate, for example, um, and that's what's in part of that matrix. And that's what gives it its strength, its hard, um, hard uh, matrix, right? So we don't really find this composition of matrix anywhere else in the body. So it really gives um, bone a very um, exceptional property of, you know, strength, but also flexibility. So bone tissue is quite unique. So let's look a little bit more at the bone cells. So we have bo uh, bone cells that are gonna be producing bone. We gonna, we're gonna have mature cells, and then we're gonna have these very specialized cells that actually eat bone. So we have bone uh, stem cells, and those are our osteoprogenitor cells. So they're gonna differentiate into our bone producing cells, which are our osteoblasts. So we have our stem cell, which then gives rise to our osteoblast. So always think a blast, uh, blast actually means bud, so kind of formation, new growth, right? Um, so this is going to be the cell that's actively producing all that bony matrix. And we call matrix, the bone matrix itself, itself osteoid. Okay, so osteoid is just a special name for bone matrix. And then once it, it has produced all of that bone matrix, it gets stuck in its lacunae, right? So, and that's gonna be that osteocyte. And site just means cell. So it's a mature cell. It's gonna maintain the health of the bone. Uh, so it's not a dead cell, it's a live mature cell, and it's gonna be important in maintaining that health of the tissue. And then our very cool cell, uh, which is not part of the lineage of our bone cells, so it doesn't come from that osteoprogenitor cell, it's something completely different. Um, it actually has multiple nuclei, so it's a very strange cell, and it's called an osteoclast. And clast means to break. So it essentially breaks down and eats and uh, resorbs bone tissue, okay? So this is very important when we're talking about our bone remodeling. 
So let's take a look at those osteoclasts a little closer. So they're huge cells. Um, like I said, they have many uh, nuclei. And essentially what they do is they kind of crawl along the bony surface and they secrete um, these uh, compounds such as uh, acid, so hydrochloric acid, uh, enzymes, and essentially those between the acid and the enzymes that actually breaks down that bone tissue. And they are derived, like I said, they're not um, derived from the bone cell line. They are actually derived from a white blood cell. So they're a little bit more uh, like a macrophage, um, a cell that eats things, right? So this guy, so if we look at our uh, picture here, this is our bone matrix with our little osteocyte sitting in a lacunae. And essentially this little guy is, our big guy, is our osteoclast that's going to be moving along the edge and it's going to be breaking down that bone tissue as it goes. And then once that breaks down, then we get those osteoblasts coming in to lay down new bone matrix. So there's a constant turnover of breaking down bone and creating new bone. All the time it's happening. So now if we actually look at all the different types of bones in our body, we can actually classify them by shape. So if we look at all of the different ones, right? Some are longer, some are shorter, some are kind of irregular. So here's how we classify them. And I think it's fairly straightforward. So we have long bones. So what long bones means, it doesn't mean big bones. It just means that the bone is longer than it is wide. So it has a shaft with two ends, okay? And then we have short bones. Okay, so these guys are kind of roughly cuboidal shaped, so they kind of are as tall as they are wide. Okay, so found like in our ankle and our wrist. And then we have flat bones. So these guys are thin and flattened. Uh, usually they have a little curve to them. Okay, so skull bones, um, sternum, okay, those guys are flat bones. And then the irregular shaped bones are kind of ones that don't fit in either of the other three categories. So they may have some flat sides or long sides. And so these are our vertebrae and our pelvis. Okay, They just kind of don't fit in any other category. So now let's get into the gross anatomy of bones. Okay, so what is the different type of bone tissue? So we've kind of looked at how bone tissue uh, develops, right? It's constantly being broken down and created. But if we were to look at the inside of a bone, right, what, what are we looking at? So first we have compact bone. Okay. So compact bone is the dense outer layer of bone. So when you would just look at a bone, you're looking at that outer compact layer of bone. But when you actually open up the bone, like if you were to do a cross section or a longitudinal section, you would see that inside we have what's called spongy or woven bone. So it's kind of this internal network of bone um, and it has pockets um, in between the um, little trabeculae. So we call them uh, trabeculae, which are these kind of beams or little spears that kind of connect up. And there's open spaces in between those trabeculae. They look like holes, right? Or like a sponge, right? That's why they call it spongy bone. They also call it woven bone. You can name it either way. I usually use the word spongy. And so there isn't air in between all these trabeculae. This is where the bone marrow lives. So it's all filled with red bone marrow in amongst this spongy bone, okay? So I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen this type of candy bar, but it always now reminds me of bone tissue. So I think it's more popular in Europe, uh, but you have this, you know, outer layer of chocolate with this kind of spongy air filled uh, chocolate on the inside. But of course, if it were bone, it'd be filled with bone marrow. But 
if that helps you remember what bone looks like, it kind of gives me a laugh. So now let's actually look at some long bone structure. So he said we know we have compact bone on the outside and some spongy bone on the inside. So now we have those different types of different classification of bones, different types of bones, right? Our long bones, short bones, flat, irregular. So long bones have a very specific structure. All the other ones are fairly similar, but long bones are a little bit different. So we have what's called a diaphysis. So the diaphysis is the actual shaft of the bone, so the long part of the long bone. And then on either end, we have an epiphysis. Okay? And these epiphyses, plural, have the articular cartilage. So it has that hyaline cartilage on top of it, which is going to articulate or come into contact with another bone. Right, so that's going to form your joint. Okay, and we'll talk a lot about uh, articulations and joints later. We're going to have blood vessels, right? So all these bones are going to be very well vascularized. So you have a, a blood vessel coming in, uh, piercing through. It's going to be a little hole that's going to allow it to go into the inside and into that spongy bone. Okay. Now you might say, okay, well, I see spongy bone up here in the epiphysis, but what about this kind of open cavity inside the diaphysis? Well, that's the medullary cavity. So there's this hollow cavity inside the diaphysis, and it's filled with a different type of bone marrow. So we have red bone marrow up in the spongy bone, and we have yellow bone marrow in the shaft of the bone, in the medullary cavity. And the yellow comes from fat. So adipose tissue or fat tissue is kind of a yellow color. And so this is where we store some fat and that's where that energy comes from, the energy metabolism. Okay, so it's not responsible for making any blood cells. Okay, and that's only the red bone marrow. Now remember we said that our cartilage has a membrane on the outside, right? Now we have membranes on bones as well. So now we have an outside membrane and an inside membrane. So the periosteum is gonna be outside. So anywhere that there is no cartilage, because remember cartilage has its own perichondrium, so no periosteum found there, but as soon as you hit that bone tissue, all of the lining uh, on the outside of the bone is periosteum. Okay? And then we have that medullary cavity, the opening on the inside, we have all that trabeculae, those surfaces in the spongy bone, and that's all gonna be lined with endosteum. So inside is going to be that end osteum. So any surface that you see inside the bone is going to have end osteum on it. Okay, so every surface of the bone is going to have a membrane on it, except for where that cartilage is. Okay. Now, what about all those other different shapes? So we just call them non long bone, okay, because they all have the similar structure. So essentially the, all the short bones, flat bones, and irregular bones. And they're much less complex than the long bones. So essentially they just have compact bone on the outside and spongy bone on the inside. So you kind of take out uh, the medullary cavity and that yellow uh, bone marrow. Okay, so very straightforward for non-long bone uh, structure. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about those bone membranes, right? So our periosteum on the outside, endosteum on the inside. And this is really how we get our blood and nerve supply into the bone. So the other big thing, remember we talked about the perichondrium on the cartilage having those chondroblasts in there. Well, this is the same thing for our bone membranes. They contain osteogenic cells. So instead of just seeing the osteoblasts live there, because we also have those osteoclasts. So we have two different types of cells, one that breaks down the bone and one that makes the bone. So we just refer to them both as osteogenic. Genic. 
So on the surfaces of the bone, whether that's inside or outside, we're going to have those osteoclasts and osteoblasts constantly remodeling the bone. Okay, so it's going to break down the bone with the osteoclast and remodel it and lay down new bone with the osteoblasts. So again, that periosteum is covering all the outside surface of the bone, except for where the cartilage is. Okay, and what happens is, is they have these little perforating collagen fibers that essentially attach into the bone tissue because the periosteum itself is um, a dense connective tissue. So it's not bone tissue, right? But it has to kind of anchor itself to the bone tissue. So these little uh, strong fiber bundles are going to perforate into the bone tissue to um, anchor it to the bone, okay? Same with the endosteum, but it's just not as, it doesn't have to be as strongly attached, okay? So it's just gonna line all the surfaces inside that medullary cavity, um, inside these canals. We'll talk about these central canals, which is how we get uh, blood supply through the bone, okay? and any um, trabeculae in that spongy bone, all of that's going to be lined with end osteum. So this is really the site of bone remodeling. So all the breakdown and development of new bone. So now we may think of bone, right? And everybody has an image of what bones look like, right? like that chicken bone or that steak bone that you've eaten, right? Well, that is dead bone. So I want you guys to kind of erase that idea from your mind that that is what bone looks like. Yes, that's what dead bone looks like, but not living bone. Okay, so living bone is a very different thing, okay? So it looks very different than what we think of. So this is an image of a fresh bone, okay? Lots of blood, right? Because all of that bone marrow, that red bone marrow, you can see a little bit um, into the yellow bone marrow. So there's a lot of living things in the bone, okay? It's a living organ. So there's a constant turnover of calcium. Right, so the bone matrix is constantly being uh, remodeled and re broken down and rebuilt. So essentially you need that calcium, right, every day. And you don't need to know how much calcium, it's just to get an idea, but that's a lot of calcium, 500 milligrams, can enter or leave the skeleton every day. So that's a constant breakdown and remodeling um, of bony tissue. Okay, and so you're, because you're constantly remodeling, you're going to be replacing your bone every few years. So when we're talking about all that spongy bone, essentially if you look at one piece of bone, it'll be replaced every three to four years. Okay, the compact bone on the outside takes a lot longer, so it's replaced about every 10 years. Okay, so just lots of remodeling going on all day long. So I think I've hit home a little bit about the bone remodeling, but just to kind of put it down into words for you guys. So there's going to be this constant turnover. Right. So on these outer and inner surfaces, whether it's periosteum or endosteum um, or we call it periosteal or endosteal surfaces, that's where it's going to be happening. OK, so all the surfaces and you're going to get bone resorption by the osteoclast and bone deposition or bone modeling uh, by the osteoblast. So if you were to blow up a picture of a trabeculae and just look at that surface, you're going to have those osteoclasts, which are these big guys coming in, eating or dissolving that bone tissue, that bone matrix or osteoid. And then once you get a hole, you're going to have those osteoblasts come in and lay down new bone matrix. Okay. So another cool thing about bones and why they're all kind of different shaped 
is that the bone is able to react to external stress, right? So there's all these muscles and tendons and ligaments that are going to be pulling on the bone surface, okay, on that periosteum, actually. And so then what happens is that your bone reacts to those compression and tension areas. Um, and then they're going to lay down more bone to reinforce it. So the bone compensates by laying down um, more bone or even creating a specific pattern in the trabeculae. So if you look, and of course you don't need to know, you know all these points of compression or tension, but if you just look at the example here, we have the head of the femur. Right, so lots of body weight coming down on that head of the femur. And you might think, yes, there's a huge stressor here on the neck of that femur, right? So what happens is, is internally, you're gonna lay down these trabeculae, um, the spongy bone trabeculae in certain patterns, kind of like the buttresses of a roof to kind of compensate for that load of the body weight, okay? And then, you know, externally, you have all these bumps and ridges and grooves, and we call those bone markings. And the bone markings just reflect all those external stresses on the bone. And this is what you guys are gonna be learning in lab, is that you're gonna be looking at all these bones and all these bone markings, and they actually have different names. Like we said, this is the head of the femur, right? And these are trochanters, these big bumps on the side. So again, you guys are going to learn all these names of these bone markings, but now you know kind of why they have these bumps and ridges and grooves, right? And when we learn the muscles and where they all attach to the bones, that'll make a lot more sense, okay? So bone markings. Right, so these guys are those bumps and grooves and ridges that are going to reflect the different stresses that are um, put on that bone by our muscles, our tendons and ligaments, right? And we have three kind of big categories of bone markings. So you're going to have projections, so things that are going to project from the surface. These are our bumps, right? And these are really going to be attachments of those tendons and ligaments, okay? So like these tubercles here or these epicondyles, these guys are projections. And this is where a lot of these um, collateral ligaments are going to attach. Okay, in the elbow. This is the humerus okay, of your upper arm. Okay. You're going to have surfaces that are going to form joints. So usually these are going to be nice and smooth because that's where the cartilage is found. Okay, so that's going to be the head, right? The head of the humerus or the head of the femur. Nice and smooth, right? And then you have uh, this area at the bottom of the humerus that's going to create your elbow joint. So we actually have some condyles that have special names down here, and you'll learn all of these. And so it's nice and smooth joint surface, articular surface. And then you have depressions, right, or grooves or something like that that's going to allow for maybe another bone to interact there. Right? So you have your elbow joints. So you need a spot for that uh, radius and ulna to come in okay? when you bend your elbow. So again, don't, so don't panic about all these different uh, bone markings, but there's going to be certain names that you're going to see over and over again. Okay, like a tuberosity or a spine or a process, a head. So if you go through kind of all these um, general bone markings and look at what the descriptions are, then when you see that word again in a bone marking on a specific bone, you'll say, hey, I've seen that before. That should look like this. Okay, so such as like a fossa is going to be a hole. Okay or a depression, a groove, right, fissure. Some of these make sense, but again, it just kind of gives you an idea of the general bone markings.
So now we've kind of covered our macroscopic structure of bone. So we've looked at compact bones, spongy bone, our different classifications of types of bones, um, bone markings, right? So all the kind of gross anatomy of the bones. And now we're going to look at the microscopic structure of bones. So we're going to look at um, what it looks like under the microscope, okay? Uh, but first we're going to start with our compact bone. So remember we have compact bone and we have spongy bone. So first let's look at the compact bone. And that's what this image is over here. Okay, so first we have a, a microscope image and then we have a drawing of what that compact bone looks like. So compact bone is very strong, but it's very important because it also has passageways through the compact bone for blood, um, lymphatic vessels, and nerves. Okay, so all that good stuff that's coming into the bones um, are going to come through the compact bone and through some of these canals. So we have central canals. Okay, which is going to be the biggest kind of vertical canal. So here's a central canal. Here's another central canal. So kind of this up and down vertical canal in the middle of the ring. Okay, so we see kind of these tree rings and we'll talk about that in a minute. And in the middle of that, you see a central canal. Okay. But those central canals have to talk to each other. And that's what the perforating canals are. So perforating canals just connect up all the central canals. And they connect up then with that medullary cavity, okay? If it's a um, long bone, right? And we have a medullary cavity. Now the big thing about compact bone is the osteon. Okay, so if we think of kind of compact bone like a tree, Okay, and you think of the trunk of the tree, you know, vertical um, trunk of the tree. The osteon is what is going to be those columns, those cylindrical columns that are going to run up and down the tree trunk. Okay, now it looks like a tree because it's like tree rings. Okay, if you've ever done a cross section of a tree, you can see how a tree grows, right? It grows um, from the inside out, and that's what an osteon does. It grows from that central canal outward and creates these um, concentric rings, okay? So just like a tree ring, so think tree trunk, kind of a tree and the tree rings, okay, around that uh, central canal. So if we look at another picture of our compact bone, we can see the spongy bone kind of on the inside lining the medullary cavity, and then we have those perforating canals. A lot of people call them Volkmann Canal. You'll see that if you read it um, you know, in the textbook or maybe online, but I like perforating canal better because it tells you kind of what it's doing, right? Same with those central canals. They have another name as well, haversion canals. But again, they're kind of they're kind of going away from haversion and Volkmann. Um, so I just I like to use central and perforating canals. Okay. So here's our osteon, right? So you see multiple osteons in the compact bone. Okay. So they are our um, tree rings. Okay, multiple tree rings, and each tree ring is called a lamellae. Okay, so lamellae is going to be your tree ring. Okay, so you have concentric lamellae around that osteon, around that central canal, and then you have these kind of circumferential lamellae, which are all the way around the outside of the bone. Okay. Now let's look at the osteon a little more closely as well, okay? So we said all the osteons are centered around a central canal, right? That's where our nerve and our blood supply is. And then we have those osteocytes, 
And again, you have the end osteum lining that central canal, and that's where all your osteoblasts, osteoclasts are. So those osteoblasts are be producing the cell matrix or the bone matrix, and then they get stuck, right? And they become your osteocytes. Osteocytes get stuck, okay? And they are gonna be what are creating kind of those concentric lamellae, okay? So the lamellae are those tree rings, right? It's concentric around that central canal. But then even though these cells, these osteocytes, get stuck in the lacunae, they're active cells. So they have to talk to each other, right? And they're stuck in this fairly hard matrix, right? This calcium matrix. So they have to be able to provide nutrients to each other. And that's what these little canuliculi are. And there are these little tiny kind of spider leg looking things where the cells can talk to each other and send nutrients and things to each other, okay? So it's all going to come in through that central canal and then it'll perforate through all these canuliculi to all those osteocytes, right? I want to keep those cells living and happy. So that was compact bone. So compact bone is a little more complex with those osteons. Okay, so osteons are only found in compact bone. We don't see it in spongy bone, okay? So it's a lot less complex. And essentially the trabeculae are just made of layers of lamellae and osteocytes. So instead of having concentric lamellae, they call it interstitial lamellae. And essentially it's just, you know, they look like a partial ring, right? It's not quite full ring and the osteocytes are uh, stuck in their lacunae as well. So same thing, but you just don't get that uh, ring-like structure because there's no central canal. So there's no central canal. It's too small. It's just this little uh, bony trabeculae, right? So not enough time to really build those um, osteons. We have no central canal. We have no um, direct blood supply because we are kind of just submerged in bone marrow. So bone marrow has plenty of nutrients and supply uh, for the spongy bone. So we don't need the direct blood supply because we're just sitting in bone marrow, okay? So no central canal, no osteons. We just have kind of these layers of lamellae, okay? So now let's talk a little bit about bone development. So now we know what bone tissue looks like macroscopically and microscopically, but how do we actually build our bones, right? And that's that process is called ossification or osteogenesis. So that's how our uh, how we develop bones starting in the embryo and then continuing through adolescence when we're still growing. And then obviously it slows quite a bit in the, in the adult. We're not, you know, getting any longer bones or bigger bones. We're just uh, remodeling those bones. Okay. And that's what we've talked about up till now. But how do we grow those bones uh, in the beginning? So there's two ways we can do this. So we call it ossification. So the first type is intramembranous ossification. Okay, and these are really just our flat bones. Okay, and very specifically our skull bones. And we call those bones membranous bones. Okay, so it's formed directly from that mesenchyme tissue. So remember when we talked about our different tissue types and we said all connective tissue comes from that stem cell tissue, that mesenchyme tissue. So essentially it's just going to start um, differentiating. Those stem cells are just going to differentiate into uh, osteoblasts. Okay, and then they're just going to start laying down bone and we'll go through that process. Okay, so that's intramembranous ossification. The other way is called endochondral ossification. So if you look in the word chondral, what is that? That's cartilage. 
So inside cartilage, if you kind of think of that, endochondral. Okay, so first we start out as hyaline cartilage. Okay, so most bones in your body undergo endochondral ossification. The only ones that don't are really your skull bones, which are flat bones. Okay, so most bones develop via endochondral ossification. Okay. So this is just showing your um, skull bones developing in that intramembranous ossification. And then we have a long bone down here, and that's how we get growth plates, right? So you always think of, you know, kids having growth plates. They have growing pains, right? And then so if you look at a, a radiograph of a younger person's wrist, you can actually see those growth plates. They actually look like fractures because in that line, it's uh, cartilage. Okay, so cartilage doesn't show white on an x-ray like bone does. So it actually looks like a fracture. But then when you look at an adult wrist, those lines are gone, those black lines are gone, and you can see kind of even a brighter white line right there, and that's a closed growth plate. So we'll talk about how growth plates function uh, to extend the length of our long bones, and that's endochondral ossification. Okay, so I know this looks very busy and kind of crazy, don't panic, we'll just kind of walk through it slowly, and you don't need to know all the crazy details, okay? So this is intramembranous ossification. So this is how our flat bones of the skull develop. So essentially this background tissue is just that mesenchymal tissue, right? So our stem cell tissue that all of our connective tissue comes from. And then what happens is some of these cells just kind of start differentiating into osteoblasts, okay? They just decide to become osteoblasts or bone cells. So then those osteoblasts start laying down bone tissue and they become osteocytes, right? So they just keep kind of laying down bone, okay? Which becomes um, ossified or you know calcified, okay? And then it becomes bone tissue. And then what happens is, is you start developing a spongy bone, okay? So essentially we get some blood vessels coming in here and kind of creating the trabeculae and those kind of openings, okay? And then once you kind of create this spongy bone, you're actually gonna lay down compact bone on the outside. And we call that um, lamellar bone. So lamellar bone is the same as compact bone, okay? And so it uh, develops on that outside and then therefore you have spongy bone on the inside, uh, compact bone on the outside, and those blood vessels kind of turn into our uh, red marrow, bone marrow, okay? So again, if you read through these, you know, don't get caught up too much on the details, but um, it might help uh, to might help you understand what's going on. This is just from your textbook, so you can read about it as well in there. But just kind of understand the general concept of, you know, it's coming from mesenchymal tissue that differentiate, differentiates into uh, bone cells that is gonna just lay down bone. First you have your spongy bone, then your compact bone, okay? Now endochondral ossification is a little more challenging, okay, but this is how the majority of our bones develop in our body. So the skull bones and weirdly enough our clavicles, which is our collar bones, uh, those guys undergo that, um, that intramembranous ossification. So first we're going to be hyaline cartilage. So a little bone kind of is in the shape of a bone, but it's in hyaline cartilage first. It's made out of cartilage. Uh, so about, you know, late in the second month of embryonic development is when this starts happening, okay? So when you start uh, making your little bones out of cartilage first. And essentially it continues into adulthood, right? When you stop growing, that's when endochondral ossification stops.
Okay, so we're going to go through this picture in a little bit more detail. And again, you don't need to know all the nitty gritty details. I'm just going to kind of explain what I want you to know from it because it is a very complex um, process. So first what's going to happen is, so the blue is going to be your highland cartilage. Okay, so what happens is, is you kind of create a little bone out of cartilage. And then you're going to start laying down um, a little bit of compact bone on what would become the diaphysis, right, the shaft of the bone. But what happens is by laying down a little bit of bone on the outside, you're going to create this kind of ossification center in the middle because the, the cartilage cells then start to die in the middle. Okay, So you're creating a little bone on the outside, which then gives you a periosteum. So the perichondrium kind of becomes a periosteum. So you lay, start laying down bone from that periosteum. Okay. So then we said that little primary ossification center means that those little cartilage cells actually start to die. Okay. So the cartilage starts to die okay, because it's kind of cut off from the nutrients. Okay. And so it creates kind of a cavity. Okay. So that will become your medullary cavity. Okay. And then what happens is because it kind of starts to die and create a cavity, you've got a blood vessel that tries to come into the rescue. Okay. So that uh, blood vessel kind of comes into that primary center of ossification. Okay. And that's where your spongy bone starts to take place. So it brings in your osteoblasts and it's going to start laying down some spongy bone. Okay. So now in this, and again, you can kind of pay attention to a little bit of the time frame, but I'm not going to ask you exactly, all, you know, where are you at birth, but um, this is what's happening at birth, which is kind of interesting. So you definitely have not finished your bone growth yet, right? So the diaphysis starts to elongate. Your medullary cavity gets a little more distinct. So that's the primary center of ossification. And now you have a secondary center of ossification. So again, kind of this center of the epiphysis is going to start kind of um, eroding. The uh, cartilage cells are going to start dying and you're going to get another blood vessel that's going to come in and bring in some more osteogenic cells so to lay down some spongy bone okay so then what happens is is you have these two areas of ossification primary and secondary centers of ossification so that's your diaphysis and your two epiphyses what happens is then you create between those two a line of cartilage and that's your epiphyseal plate which is also known as your growth plate right so you have this junction between the diaphysis and the epiphysis that still contains some cartilage and that's how you continue to elongate your long bones as you grow so this is what's happening as you're growing into adulthood into adolescence okay so this stays cartilage until you're done growing and then that bone will finally fill in and ossify, okay? So let's talk a little bit more about the epiphyseal plate and how it grows, okay? So this is how your long bones are gonna continue to grow um, through adolescence. Okay, so cartilage divides very quickly. So the cartilage cells are able to divide and organize quite quickly. So they're able to elongate, okay? So they kind of form these little stacks of cells, okay? So the chondroblasts are gonna keep dividing and stacking so if we look over here, so here's our, um, remember our radiograph of our epiphyseal plate or growth plate, and you blow up just that section and you're going to take a look here. 
Okay, so this end here is going to be your epiphysis up here. Okay, and then below is going to be your diaphysis. Okay, so what happens is, is all these uh, cartilage cells are going to proliferate. So they're going to quickly divide. They're kind of going to become little stacks of cells. But then what happens is that they start to die. Okay, they hypertrophy, meaning they enlarge, and then they start to die and start to calcify. Okay, so then your uh, bone tissue down here is going to start replacing all that kind of calcified cartilage into bony tissue. Okay. So what happens is the epiphysis starts to move away from the diaphysis, okay? And this is happening on both ends of the bone, remember? So you have both epiphyses growing away from the diaphysis. So maybe I can draw a little picture here, which might help. So if this is the epiphysis, I'll put an E for epiphysis, and this is the diaphysis side. So all of these cells are going to be dividing and growing. So they're going to be pushing away from the diaphysis towards the epiphysis. And if that's happening on both ends, then the entire bone is going to elongate. Okay. So hopefully that makes a little more sense. So here I've kind of laid out a picture of what we just looked at, looked at but also a, a drawing to kind of hopefully make it make a little more sense. So essentially I'm just um, writing out what I just said on the last slide. So essentially your chondrocytes are going to start to calcify because they're going to die, they're going to disintegrate, and then your bone tissue is going to come in and create spongy bone. Okay on the diaphyseal end. So remember your uh, chondrocytes, your cartilage is going to be towards the epiphyseal end and your um, bony tissue is going to be toward the diaphyseal end. Okay. So the cool thing about um, your uh, epiphyseal growth or your growth plates, right, is the thickness of that growth plate is going to maintain a constant thickness because as you're laying down more cartilage, you're also replacing the old cartilage with bone. So the growth plate isn't going to get any bigger, it's just going to be moving, it's going to be elongating the bone. Okay, so during childhood and adolescence, you're really just going to be growing the length of the bone, okay, but the epiphyseal plate is going to stay the same thickness. But you're also going to have to um, widen the bone as well. So you grow it, lengthen it, but you also make it wider, okay. And then once you kind of stop your growth or towards the end of adolescence, and you're going to stop uh, dividing those chondroblasts, those um, cartilage cells, right? So they're not going to divide as much. So then the epiphyseal plate starts to thin. So then it starts to be less uh, cartilage and more bone, right? And then finally, your epiphysis and your diaphysis are going to fuse so that you no longer have any cartilage tissue there. Right? So if we look at our, our radiograph again, you can see you know, a growth plate here and here, so at the ends of these different long bones. But then once you finish growing, you no longer can appreciate that growth plate. Okay? So the whole bone fuses. So just like I was saying before, even though we're growing, we're elongating the bone, we also have to widen the bone, okay? So how do we widen the bone? And that's going to be called appositional growth. So we've seen appositional growth before when we were talking about cartilage and how cartilage grows. But essentially what happens is that you're going to be laying down more bone on that, uh, the compact bone on the kind of the collar of the bone, the diaphysis, okay? 
So as you're going to lay down more compact bone, you're also going to be removing bone from that inside medullary cavity. Okay, so your medullary cavity is going to get a little bit bigger, but that bone collar is going to widen. So again, you're going to widen your bone, but not thicken your bone too much. Okay. So same thing like the epiphyseal plate maintains its thickness, same with the compact bone or the collar of the bone on that diaphysis is going to stay about the same thickness. So you're going to elongate on either end and then you're going to widen in the middle. So now that we know how bone is made and how our, our bone constantly is remodeling, now let's look a little bit about how do we heal our bone, right? So what happens when we break our bone? So first, it's going to be very similar to um, how we heal any other tissue, right? So we're going to create a hematoma, okay? Same as inflammation, right? You're going to create um, a hematoma. You're in a blood clot, right? Keep it from bleeding. A little bit easier because you have the restriction of the periosteum, right? So there's already a little bit of um, pressure from the periosteum to help keep it from bleeding. But the periosteum can also be torn as well, which is really where the pain comes from, from uh, broken bones, not necessarily internal, uh, because all the nerve supply is coming in through that periosteum. So then you're going to lay down kind of fibrous connective tissue, right? So those collagen fibers um, are going to lay down a bunch of uh, fibrous -y tissue, and we call that a soft callus. Okay, because essentially it's just the, that collagen fiber uh, being laid down first. Okay. Um, cartilage also gets laid down a little bit, so you have kind of this fibrousy cartilage tissue, so we call that fibrocartilaginous. Okay, that's the technical term. But just to be a little less technical, we call it a soft callus. So that's what I want you to remember is that soft callus, which is just kind of soft connective tissue. And then you're going to actually replace that soft callus with your bone tissue, okay, via that endochondral ossification. So again, those cartilage cells are going to die. They're going to be replaced by um, osteoid bone tissue, okay? So then you have a hard callus or a bony callus that's going to form. And then what happens is, is you're going to put that bone back under stress, right? So this is probably the phase where it's in a splint or a cast, so you're not moving the bone at all, right? So you're allowing this process to happen. And then you take your cast off, and then you actually undergo stress, right? And your bone is going to um, undergo the same stresses as it normally would have before, which allows the remodeling to happen. So take away a little bit extra bone here that we don't need, you know, reinforce our compact bone on the outside. And so all that mechanical stress, which is why it's good to actually use your uh, bone after you've obviously allowed enough healing time so that your bone can remodel back to its original shape. And bones are crazy ridiculous at healing and sometimes you can't even tell uh, that there was a fracture there um, before. It can even become stronger. So let's look at some disorders of bones. Okay, so we've looked at how it heals, but what can go wrong? So um, one disorder is called osteoporosis, which is fairly common in older women after menopause. And what happens is your bone becomes really porous. So essentially you're having more bone resorption than you are bone uh, deposition or modeling. So you're breaking down more bone than you're laying down. So if you look at the picture over here, here's our normal spongy bone, right, with our trabeculae, and you notice an osteoporotic bone, you have um, these porous holes, 
So that's where the porosis comes from is porous, right? So the bone becomes porous and a lot less um, strong. Right, so that's why uh, they're more prone to breaking bones uh, if you have osteoporosis. Osteomalacia um, is the same thing as rickets in children. So essentially, what happens is you don't mineralize your bone your bone matrix. So you don't have enough vitamin D which doesn't allow you to lay down the correct amount of calcium in your bones. Okay, so vitamin D has a lot to do with calcium, um, and so that's what happens. Okay, so your bones essentially are uh, too flexible. So you're missing the calcium, that inorganic component, and so you become, you get these really flexible and bent bones. So you get these kind of bowed leg look is very common with, uh, so this is rickets. So rickets is the same thing, but in children and osteomalacia is in adults. And then last but not least, we obviously can have um, bone cancer. So osteosarcoma, which essentially is you're just kind of laying down a bunch of bone willy nilly. So it doesn't make sense. So essentially your bone just kind of starts laying down bone wherever the heck it wants and it creates, uh, it destabilizes the bone tissue. So then you are set up for fractures as well. So this is um, a knee joint, okay, so a tibia, and then you just have all this kind of fluffy new bone that's laid down on the outside of the tibia, which is just very, um, abnormal. This is common in dogs as well too. Dogs get osteosarcoma. Um, and the good thing about dogs is they do really well three-legged. So a lot of the times if you have, if they have osteosarcoma, they'll just uh, remove the leg and they can do really, really well. Not so much in people. We treat it a little bit um, less aggressively than removing the limb, but you can. Here are our learning objectives for today. Okay, so go through those, make sure you're familiar with everything, make yourself a study guide for the lecture. And we have some reading and study questions if you want to do some more questions out of the book. And next lecture, we're gonna look, we're gonna talk about the axial skeleton. So we're gonna split up the skeleton into the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton, okay? Thanks, and hopefully I'll see you guys in office hours.